Welcome to Civitas LA, where we feature diverse and emerging leaders who make up this dynamic region and are creating community every day and building a better tomorrow. My name is Dwayne Gathers, creator and host of Civitas LA. In these bi-weekly conversations, we hear from, learn from, and are inspired by a new generation of civic entrepreneurs who are forging a path forward in making Los Angeles a stronger, more resilient, and connected group of citizens. Now more than ever, we aim to elevate civic discourse, foster community connections, and promote civic knowledge and engagement across the greater Los Angeles region while elevating diverse and emerging voices in the civic conversation. Today we are joined by Reiko Kerr and Phyllis Curry. As co-lead of LADWP, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power's power system, Ms. Kerr is the first woman to run this element of LADWP's operation. In this role, she manages all aspects of the power system's critical engineering and planning functions, including generation, transmission, distribution engineering, business development, renewable energy programs, and contracts. In addition, Rako's responsible for developing strategies to transition toward a very aggressive sustainable energy future, improving public accountability, and developing the next generation workforce. Ms. Curry chairs the board of directors of the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, a regional transmission organization that runs an energy market and manages transmission assets in 15 states. Previously, she served as general manager of Pasadena Water and Power and served in several roles in LA city government including at the Department of Water and Power as well, where she served as Chief Financial Officer. So thank you both for calling in this afternoon and joining us as we discuss the challenge and opportunity to grow the ranks of women in science, technology, engineering, and math, and efforts to close the gender gap in the energy and utility sector. Both of you, I know, have been actively involved in this over the course of your respective careers, but also through various civic organizations, including the Association of Women in Water, Energy, and the Environment. Reiko and Phyllis, welcome to Civitas LA. Thank you, Dwayne. It truly is a pleasure to be here with both you and Phyllis. Yes, uh, Dwayne, this is really great. Great opportunity, and, and Reiko is a, a great role model for you to feature. Well, thank you both, because you know, not only am I grateful to have you here to discuss today's topic, but as you both are aware, you know, I'm, and I'm looking at a CNBC article from yesterday that in the West region, we're under an extreme heat wave right now, gripping the U.S. with a good chunk of the U.S. Um, facing triple digit temperatures. So um, your work is doubly important because you are both responsible for keeping the energy grids alive and well during this extreme heat wave. So thank you for that. Always a challenge, but it's all good. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Phyllis and Reiko, let's start with a few warm-up questions with uh, a brief introduction. Um, share with us a, just a brief background. Um, Reiko, we'll start with you. Sure. Dwayne, so I was the youngest of three children. My dad was in the military, so things were tight. And I was one of those kids who couldn't afford college. So worked at a restaurant for 17 years, starting at the age of 14, ultimately working up to management while I was still in high school and subsequently became an uh, an owner. This was an invaluable experience as someone just entering the work the, the work environment, and I, I learned so much about customer service, working hard, managing people, working as a team, and giving young folks opportunities. Ultimately, I did go back to school and fulfilled my high school dream of becoming a certified public accountant. I worked in a large regional public accounting firm for about five years before I joined the utility industry, and for the last 17 years, uh, not last 17 years, for 17 years I worked at a medium-sized utility starting as an entry-level manager, a principal analyst on the finance side and ultimately worked my way up to the ge assistant general manager, chief financial officer. And in, in that capacity, I was very fortunate to have uh, an opportunity to switch business functions and became the assistant general manager of power resources that further expanded my skill set and knowledge in this industry. So. Uh, in 2016, I joined LADWP and have been here for almost five years and am currently leading that transition to 100% clean energy during the most rapid change this industry has ever seen. Other very important uh, initiatives are preserving reliability and resilience as we ensure an equitable transition that recognizes the diverse communities that we serve. We are also focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are all very high priorities for our futures. Excellent. Thank you so much, Reiko. Phyllis, give our audience a brief personal introduction, please. Well, I'm that rarity, a native Angelino, okay. born and bred here in Los Angeles. 
although my family came out during the 40s okay. uh, from the Piney Woods of East Texas. Okay. Uh, but I went to local schools. Shout out to Manual Arts High School. UCLA, worked for the city of LA for 30 years. Then uh, I went to Pasadena as their utility director for 14 years. And since then, uh, I've been uh, chairing the board of the, uh, as you mentioned, a regional uh, transmission organization in the Midwest. In fact, I just finished a round of uh, board meetings this week. Excellent. Well, thank you both. Well, we're going to start easy on you because um, as a podcast focused, and some people find this actually the hardest part of the conversation, but uh, we always like to start with a lightning round where we get to know um, your Los Angeles through a few quick lightning round questions and explore some of your favorites about our great region. So are you ready? Sure. Ready. Favorite restaurant or two, Phyllis? Nick's in Manhattan Beach. Okay. Haven't been there. Rako? Um, Sunset Beach, Captain Jack's, if you want something more local uh, for just uh, lunch, Masa's Pizza in Echo Park. Echo Park, okay, excellent. Favorite watering hole, if you like watering holes, that is, Rayco. So my favorite is actually in San Diego, uh, a bar called Positive Provisions. There is a very unique one in L.A., the Edison Bar. Okay, okay. Nice. Well, that's a, that's like a young hipster spot, actually. Okay. Uh, Phyllis, favorite watering hole? The Taco Tuesday Happy Hour at Seoul and Playa Vista. Okay, I got to go out there for that one. Favorite place to take a visitor, Reiko? So there are lots of fun and interesting places in L.A., but I'm just that kid. I love the zoo. I can go to the zoo and have fun every single time. Excellent. Phyllis? There's a great restaurant in Malibu with a great ocean view. Jeffries. Okay. Okay. Phyllis, you're fancy. Uh, favorite hidden gem? Give us a hidden gem. Reiko. Oh, that's a tough one. I know there's a couple things I want to search out. Uh, it could hit your watering hole, but there's a pirate bar and a martini ice bar I hear that I need to get to in LA. Okay. Phyllis, you have a favorite hidden gem that our guests should know about? Oh, yes. In the San Fernando Valley, there are Japanese gardens that were built as part of the Tillman Water Reclamation Plant. Okay. Water reclamation is a fancy word for a sewer plant. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go we're gonna go visit a sewer plant. I like that. Outdoor space is always a, a, a big favorite for Angelinos and visitors. Give us a favorite hike or favorite park in Los Angeles in the region. Freco? So I'm limited because I think I spend too much time at work. But so I've been to Grand Park and Echo Park, but I've enjoyed those. Okay. Phyllis. Uh, Kenneth Hahn State Park in Baldwin Hills. Okay. That, that park is beautiful. And that has come up a number of times. So thank you. I need to get out more. <laughs> <laughs> favorite, favorite neighborhood in our region, Reiko. Ah, I like Little Tokyo or Larchmont. Okay. But I also like to just meander through the streets because there's so many fascinating neighborhoods here. Absolutely. Phyllis, do you have a favorite neighborhood in the region? Playa Vista, especially the uh, Saturday Farmer's Market. Okay, we'll have to go out there. Okay, so I, I detect from these questions that Phyllis is kind of a West Side person. You know, Malibu, Playa Vista a lot. You know, it's interesting. So let's begin our conversation this afternoon. Again, I really appreciate you both being on. Reiko, in a recent interview, you encouraged other women in STEM to be flexible and to not map out their path, saying that if you had mapped out your path, you'd be totally wrong. So you referenced earlier that you're actually a CPA by training, have a background in finance. Tell us how you ended up leading DWP's power system and how um, you found your way into the utility sector. Thank you, Dwayne. So we know that women are underrepresented in utilities. and. I mentioned working at a medium-sized utility in various roles, and um, you know, you mentioned my background, but I was fortunate to work at a place where my general manager at the time, Dave Wright, saw something in me. Uh, was it work ethic, analytics, strategic vision, success in other projects, or something else? I don't know. Uh, but um, one of my colleagues here at LADWP, Andy Kendall, likes to say, every day is an interview. So my, I may not have interacted with him every day, but he knew enough of my work and some of the work products that I had sent out, and he clearly saw something and became my champion for whatever reason. And that is invaluable advice for anyone coming up through the ranks, that every day is an interview. Even if you're not interacting directly, people observe. 
So I was fortunate that Dave Wright gave me some opportunities and encouraged me to move into other functions. And he knew I had a track record for succeeding wherever I was. Um, so here's a very important point. Even in an industry that has such an underrepresentation of women, we clearly need our men role models and leaders with foresight to recognize and advocate for the advancement of women and promoting diversity. Uh, we are in, like I mentioned, the most rapid change this industry has ever had, operating with legacy systems, and change happened at a glacial pace previously. That GM ultimately ended up at LADWP and su subsequently asked me to join him and help LADWP meet those challenges and opportunities that were coming with the changes in the industry. And I am so fortunate and grateful to work with such an experienced, talented, and professional team at the department. So, Dwayne, I know many women in these industries, and many of them are at the top of their game. In fact, I would say all of them are, and the, mo the majority of them would tell you that their careers did not map out exactly as they planned. So, it's very important that you stay flexible, you be nimble. You recognize your worth at a company that values you, and that is something that is very important that Phyllis Curry said to me many, many years ago in one of a um, conference that we attended years ago. So be aware of those opportunities, and don't be afraid to take that leap when it seems right for you. Sure. No. Thank you for that. You know, Phyllis, do you want to add to that um, that comment, and would you share with us your path to leadership in, in the energy and utility sector? Well, you know, I was fortunate to, to work for the city of L.A. right out of college. And with the city being as large uh, and diverse in terms of the number of activities it does, I, I feel like I kind of hopscotched around within the city, uh, making, uh, getting new opportunities, you know, from time to time. So, you know, I worked in five departments before coming to Water and Power and learned a lot about how the city works. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think my most valuable experience was uh, I, I did about eight years as assistant city administrative officer. So I was in charge of the city's budget and the city's capital budget. And in the course of that, I did a lot of bond financing for uh, uh, parks, fire stations, uh, uh, various city facilities. And uh, that really, I think, helped me a lot when I was able to compete for the CFO position uh, at DWP. Uh, energy businesses and, and DWP is, is a premier one. They are highly intensive in capital. So you're raising money all the time. Sure. And I think my bond experience helped. But, you know, after that, uh, I actually retired. And then uh, after two years of, you know, getting bored with retirement, uh, I went to work with Pasadena. And I was only going to stay three years. Okay. Well, 14 years later, I retired again. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm doing this uh, board business with uh, in the Midwest with energy. I think the message that I would say is, did I have a plan? No, I didn't have a plan. But I was able to build on my experiences as new opportunities came my way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I would say to uh, anybody, a woman or a man. You know, try to build on experiences and take advantage of opportunities, as as Reiko and I have uh, discussed many times. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious, you know, as women rising in the ranks in the energy and utility sector, which is, you know, predominantly a male, a male dominated industry, you know, what were some of the issues that you face in, in your own journey and how were those challenges overcome? Reiko, do you want to start with that? Sure. So I mentioned I came from an accounting background and in that field, clearly there are many more women in representation. When you move to the operations side and the resources side, power supply on the side of utilities, it's very different. There are often meetings you go into where you are the only, either the only woman, the only black, the only brown, the only Asian, maybe you hit two of those buckets at the same time. So initially I did a lot of listening and understanding. And in meetings, I typically don't talk just to hear my voice, you know, hear my own voice. If I have something to say, I will, uh, certainly interject. And as time went on, I began to provide more and more input, ask questions, and ultimately developed a good track record, meeting deadlines, exceeding expectations, having a vision of where the industry was heading, and how best to adapt or mitigate um, those impacts. Uh, one of the things that is so important is networking. And uh, I, at heart, I'm an introvert. 
Uh, so this took work. Sure. Um, but networking can open a lot of doors and provide encouragement or opportunities and help manage that stress. And people sometimes are surprised when I say I'm, I'm an inter introvert, but at heart I am. Uh, you can certainly play whatever role you set your mind to, um, but it takes energy. Mm -hmm. So Phyllis was one of those early women in my career that offered advice and support. If you don't have those that network, it becomes a lot more difficult. So again, the observation that every woman at the top of this industry, without exception, didn't get there uh, on her own. She did have uh, male mentors, but every one of them got there by their own experience, skills, and knowledge. Sure. So um, we, we need those opportunities, but we, we uh, also need to support each other. No, I appreciate that. And certainly, Phyllis, you know, as an African-American woman um, in this energy um, sector, I'm curious to have you share any unique experiences, challenges along, along your journey, and how did you overcome those challenges? Well, you know, just uh, following up on some of Rachel's comments, uh, I had to get used to being the only woman, and many times the only woman and the only African-American uh, in the room. So I, I always say that I, I got comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, along the way, too, you know, uh, I got married. Uh, I had a daughter. She's, you know, doing soccer on Saturday. And then, you know, I got to do things at school. So I think balancing uh, the work life and the personal life is very challenging. And then I went back and got my uh, MBA uh, mid-career. So then I was adding, uh, you know, schoolwork. So there were a lot of things to do, but what I found that was important was, first of all, um, you know, understand what you don't know and be willing to ask questions. Um, uh, surround yourself with smart people and listen to them. And, you know, as Renko has indicated, a lot of my support came from women a lot of it came from men, but I can clearly remember a very pivotal time when I had an opportunity to take a, a, a higher level position. And I was really feeling I wasn't capable of doing it. And a woman who was in uh, city government, uh, pretty high up, uh, she called me in her office and she said, you better take that job, okay? Th these kind of opportunities don't come along very often. You take it, you go, you can do it. And, and I needed that push. I needed someone to tell me I could do it. Well, that's powerful. Well, you know, not I think it was about a year ago, maybe the maybe a year ago, the International Energy Agency uh, released a report noting that, you know, despite making up 48 percent of the global labor force, that women only accounted for about 22 percent of the traditional energy sector labor force. And particularly when you go into management, those numbers you know shrink even further. So obviously there are any number of barriers that women face in the energy sector, um, similar to other sectors. But certainly, I think as Reiko alluded to, um, what's really interesting about the energy sector sector is the amazing process of transformation that's taking place to clean energy transitions that's really going to require more innovative solutions, different business models, and probably a greater participation from a diverse labor force. So, you know, share with, share with us your thoughts on the underrepresentation, what that means for this transition, and what are some of the contributing factors, and what are some of the potential solutions to bring more gender diversity to energy during this transition? Reiko, that's a lot, I know, sorry. So first of all, Dwayne, I would say that I'm hopeful because now there is a spotlight on it and there is a genuine interest, I believe, to address it. So I believe we are starting to see change and improvement, perhaps not at the pace that we would all like to see, but I'm hopeful that the, for the future of women coming through the ranks, it will be better. There's also a ra different rate of change in different organizations. And you talk about the uh, rate of change in the utility um, in some areas like DWP where you're under a civil service system like the city of LA that has a lot of rules and procedures in place, that change can be very difficult. Um, most hiring is at the entry level, so if groups are underrepresented at that stage, it won't get any better as you go up when you have to bring them in at that lower level. The rules can be complex, and so internal candidates or folks with families and friends at those um, entities have an advantage because they have institutional knowledge of how to navigate those complexities in the rules and procedures, as well as set expectations. If if you have a job, you, you're unemployed and you need a job tomorrow, that's not going to happen in a civil service system. They just can't operate that fast and go through the all the uh, uh, protocols that they have to go through. So 
Um, that will be a challenge unless there are significant changes in their rules. What we do see with the disruption in the industry, there are a lot of new technology and innovative companies coming up, and they seem to have a higher representation of women and minorities than in a traditional utility. So um, lack of diversity when they have industry conferences, I think it's much more um, obvious. Uh, I'll give an example in the restrooms when you go in there, you know, if you go in, in, in a utility conference, the men's room would be just massively long. Yeah. You go into the women's room, you're the only one in there. Interesting. <laughs> There's no women there. So I look forward to that day when the lines in the restroom for the women are equally as long or longer than the men's because there's so many of us. And when that happens, I will not complain. Okay. Well, I know both of you serve on the board of the Association of Women in Water, Energy, and the Environment. So Phyllis, you know, speak to the work of this particular organization and how it's working to promote gender equity in this particular space. Well, you know, AWI was formed uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, I, I was lucky, and I think Rachel was lucky enough, we were able to become founding members. And, you know, we've been dedicated to creating a safe space for women so that they can share their needs and their experiences. Uh, we plan events that help them learn and share what they're learning, but also talk very candidly about what the challenges are and be able to take advantage of uh, suggestions and encouragement from women who have been there, who've experienced what they've experienced. We also have a mentorship program that is really taking off. And uh, I think we have more women wanting to be men mentors, mentor, mentored than we have mentees. Okay. okay? So uh, the mentorship uh, desire is really, really high. And I think that's something that Awi is doing a great job at. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, networking and encouragement. Mm -hmm. So many times you need to be around people who understand your concerns. You can let your hair down, literally, and, uh, you know, be, be very candid about what you're dealing with, but also be encouraged to keep working on. Rico? I'll just build on that a little bit too. Uh, because it focuses on water, energy, and the environment, we do a lot of education of the members. And we bring in the expertise to make sure that our members can stay up on those, uh, you know, high, high interest topics, um, especially as things are changing so rapidly. And of course, you know, this last year with COVID, it's been very difficult and, and all we has pivoted very easily to a virtual platform. Last year, we hosted over 80 different um, uh, digital web uh, events through AWI. This year we're going to do the same thing and uh, we know how challenging this time has been so AWI has been waiving membership fees for students as well as offering hardship memberships for people that are experiencing um, employment or uh, financial hardships during this time. So we're always looking for and welcoming new members and volunteers and Dwayne specifically for your Civitas LA listeners in the energy, water and environmental space. If their organization has fabulous women that they want to support and help develop, they can join AWI. It's a reasonable uh, annual membership fee um, that provides opportunities to network with up to 3,500 phenomenal women in California and many opportunities to learn. So there's a special for your listeners through August 31st. We're offering a 20% discount off the AWI membership rate to any Civitas LA listeners. And to join this fabulous group of women, just use the Civitas LA, all capital code, um, code uh, when you join at awi.org under the membership league. We're inclusive of men too, you don't have to be women, but if you have fabulous women you want to support at your organizations, come join AWI. Can you give us the AWI website address, please? Sure, it's awi.org, A-W-W-E-E.org. Excellent. We really appreciate that. Phyllis, you want to add something? Yeah, I would encourage cities to think about AWI because, you know, uh, right now, I think probably the perception is y you need to have a water or, or energy uh, department, but you don't. Uh, cities do a lot in the environment. They do a lot in water. And in California, something has taken off called uh, community choice aggregation. Sure. And it is cities that are banding together. They may not already have their local utility, but they are taking on the role of buying energy. So 
the people that are in that, the women, and as Rachel said, sometimes the men, you know, they would benefit from the programs that Ali provides. No, that's great. And we will definitely make sure we have a, a that in the show notes that, um, that there's a discount for new members for to join the Association of Women in Water, Energy, and the Environment, and we have the web address. So thank you for that. So, Phyllis, something that you talked about just a little while ago was the the issue of mentoring. Um, and, Reiko, I know from day one you took it as a personal responsibility to create mentoring opportunities to support emerging women engineers and new programs within LADWP's workforce. And for that work, you were recognized by the Society of Women Engineers for their SPARK Award, which honors individuals who have contributed to the advancement of women by mentoring those around them. Speak to the mentoring programs that you've created at LADWP and the impact that 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 has had. So I would say that at LADWP, relationships are more informal. Um, Like I, I talked about the civil service and creating some challenges. So we do strive for diversity at all levels. You know, we do have areas that are underrepresented, so that requires additional work. And so I mentioned the civil service, you start at the bottom, so not making meaningful change, it won't happen overnight, but we're moving in the right direction. So um, I I would tell women, don't be afraid to ask. If you see someone you admire, reach out and ask them if they're willing to meet or mentor informally. We talked about Awi, Phyllis talked about the mentorship program. It's an annual um, mentorship program where it usually runs 12 months. It's currently free to all uh, all we members. Now, this cohort is already done, but they could sign up for the next one. And I know at LADWP, we're a sustaining member. That means any woman in our organization can sign up for this. There's also the Western Energy Institute has a women in power program, a women in energy program. Same thing, a year-long mentorship. They also have a business acumen for emerging leaders program. And I was their executive mentor for 2019 for one of their cohorts that had all the young emerging leaders from utilities across the country. Uh, Leadership development, we have a uh, college instructor that's taught leadership for over 20 years that is working one-on-one with some of our uh, very young emerging leaders within the organizations. Promotions, when you look at promotions, uh, when I started here, we had one female manager, and she retired two years later. So, but today, um, you know, we've had a thousand-fold increase of that, and that one woman is the result of two of our current phenomenal women managers. And um, I talk about Lori Morris; she is doing a great job managing the transition off fossil fuels into a green hydrogen plant in Utah. Wow, Nermina uh, Ruchik O'Neill. She manages all the engineering groups that that work on our generating stations within the uh, LA Basin. And she does a lot of work in the community with the young girls because she wants more women in these non-traditional roles. And and it's so gratifying to me when we promote these women and you just see them thrive. Um, When we look at new managers, uh, we need to make sure that they understand the value of diversity, not just gender, but ethnicities too, because we make better decisions when we have folks that don't always think alike. We also have done a couple things within LADWP. I'm not taking credit for this, but within the last uh, year or two, we created the affiliate chapter of uh, the Society of Women Engineers. So we know um, that we're underrepresented in women. So we attend their regional and annual conferences, and we always have a recruiting booth to try to bring those women into uh, our fold. But like I say, it's not just gender. We also know that we want, we, we attend the National Society of Black Engineers. We attend the Society of Hispanic, Hispanic Professional Engineers. And both of those, we have our own professional affiliate at LADWP to have these, it's so important to have these resource groups that our, our employees can uh, attend. In fact, today, we just had one of those uh, webinars on Juneteenth. Okay. So it was great to see one of our professional chefs create um, succotash and uh, okay. uh, online as one of the elements of that group. We have um, recruiting at historically black colleges and universities. So we know we have a lot of work to do, Blaine, and we have a lot of forward momentum to support. We have our from the topest levels, our president of our board, Cynthia McLean Hill, as well as our general manager, Marty Adams. His whole executive team supports this effort and will continue to ensure we make the forward momentum to get where we need to be. Now, that's great. And Phyllis, you know, I know you you, you had a, a long career 
um, in various departments within the city of Los Angeles. And I'm curious to ask you this, because in 2015, um, Mayor Eric Garcetti issued Executive Directive Number 11, which regard regarding gender equity in city operations to ensure city governance is inclusionary and non-discriminatory for populations that have been previously underrepresented. And then in the most recent State of the City address, you know, the mayor talked a lot about prioritizing equity. And as you know, we've had a large conversation this past year about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I'm curious to get your perspective on those conversations today, having navigated a long career in LA city government previously, and what impact might these new directives have on opportunities for women in these sectors? Well, I think the value of these kinds of directives is that it puts attention on the need to move in the direction of diversity. You know, if you don't highlight it, if you don't make it uh, front and center, then you don't see the people who can make decisions keeping it in their minds when they're making those decisions. So I think those directives are are very, very important. And you see organizations that are very uh, deliberate uh, in their thinking about diversity and inclusion, and they make very concrete steps. And I think what we all have to be concerned about is sometimes you go through stages where diversity and conclusion is the flavor of the month. Sure. And then the interest dies down and you don't hear about it for the next five, 10 years. And I think many of us want to make sure that it is a sustained effort. Uh, I think this is one of the things where I am so proud of MISO, the Mid-Continent uh, Regional Transmission Organization, because they have not just put words to it, they have put efforts to it. Uh, MISO recently hired its chief diversity officer okay. and they hired a, a young woman. That, well, she's young as I look at her, she's a mature woman, but she's got uh, 20 years of progressive global experience okay. in the human, as a human resource leader. And so she's going to ensure that MISO's programs keep advancing. They already have six resource groups that are employee formed and employee led. And those groups, uh, some uh, are focused around women's issues, some one is particularly around African Americans. They even just started a global group because we have so many people from other countries that come to work in this industry. So the whole idea is that you make it something that is sustainable, but you also keep in mind that you have you still have your traditional white male workforce. So you've got to uh, be mindful when you're making these programs that you don't turn off other people. You want them to feel that diversity and inclusion is something that they should be supportive of as well. And includes and them I, as that well. It includes them and that there are benefits to them in terms of their thinking and how they're going to do their job, how they're going to relate to the communities that we all serve. Mm-hmm. Now, Reiko, you had mentioned that, um, you know, you noted a number of the, you know, female leadership of DWP doing amazing things. And one of the women you recognized um, does a lot of work in the community. And for Civitas LA, we've had a a number of episodes previously um, where groups have been working primarily at the kindergarten through 12 level or maybe even college level to really encourage women and and kids of color to get involved and motivated with with by STEM including you know Betty Lamar and Dawn Brown at Empower Her which which focuses on black and brown adolescent women Hal and Betty Walker from African American Male Achievers Network um, Effie Turnbull Sanders and the Slate Z organization Veronica Melvin at LA Promise Fund and and even Mel Culpepper at the Boys and Girls Club of Hollywood so they're working with our youth to get them excited and motivated around STEM, how does DWP, or in this case, you know, Phyllis, Mid-Continent ISO, leverage that work to further that pipeline so that that these young people are ready for these opportunities at your respective organizations or in the industry? Well, what I would say is, you know, I would draw on not only what DWP and uh, MISO is doing, but also what Pasadena is doing. Pasadena Water and Power has a very robust program of uh, getting kids uh, and taking them to the facilities. Okay. Uh, I mean, every year, Pasadena Water and Power has a, a public power day. They have uh, a water week in May and they get school kids. You know, sometimes they'll take the whole grade level 
of kids, say the fourth grade, you know, or the fifth or sixth grade and bring them in and let them actually see how energy and water goes from the source to their homes and businesses. And the whole idea is for them to start to understand that there are career opportunities for kids and that it, it, it makes a difference for them to pay attention in school uh, and their science and math and technology oriented you know, so the whole thing that the STEM program is trying to do is get kids to see the relevance between their studies and the futures that await them. So I think uh, those are things that really make a difference for young people. And Reiko, are, are there are there specific organizations or agencies that DWP works with to foster this pipeline of, of girls and young women for and to to engage them in STEM and potential careers? So we are always open to attending any community mil- uh, meeting you have, bringing our fabulous women, showing um, careers that are possible, not just engineering, there's field, there's all kinds of uh, different um, uh, jobs at L.A. that uh, I think you and I talked about this before with, with young girls. If I can't see it, I can't be it. And so it's so important that they see um, what's possible. And one thing I just want to acknowledge before we uh, I go into a little bit more detail um, is Dwayne the value that the, the service that you're providing here by to the LA community and highlighting some of the uh, great work that happens in this space and I know um, your recent recognition of the 2021 Hollywood uh, man of Hollywood was just phenomenal and it just goes to your character and all the great work you're doing to showcase women and and help mentor uh, women girls aunts nieces everyone um, in, in this space. So I, number one, I just want to say thank you for that. Um, at DWP, similar to what uh, uh, Phyllis talked about, we have programs where we have our women engineers go out and work with. Um, we try to even get the younger school. We'll go any age, uh, any grade. But um, when we go into the elementary schools, for instance, there's one program at Hollenbeck Middle School, and it's one of the ones that one group of engineers has um, adopted in the inner city. They chose the middle school because mentally the kids are ready to talk about physics and science and STEM. So they have monthly meetings. They're virtual now, but they talk about solar. They talk about grid. They talk about hydropower. Um, They're working on building a STEM shed, and they hope to get funding from microscopes and robots and a chemistry lab and shaker tables. And um, uh, that's just one of the programs. We do that with a number of different communities. We always are up for uh, outreach within our community so that we can have a visibility and show what's possible. And um, we can't stop until our workforce is representative of the communities we serve. And Phyllis talks about uh, lip service. And I think we we have a uh, the first all-female board in the city of Los Angeles. I mentioned being led by Cynthia McLean Hill. And she will ensure that we'll, we're held accountable. We have all this money coming out and infrastructure upgrades, not only at DWP, but LAWA and POLA and Metro and all this money coming out. And it's really important that we look at how this is going to impact our disadvantaged um, communities and, and different neighborhoods when, within L.A. and be intentional about that and uh, look towards what we want to see as outcomes. And I think you'll see... A lot more work coming out of LADWP and other city departments in this area. Well, thank you for that acknowledgement, Reiko, and, and for our audience who may not have understood this, 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 that particular piece. This, that um, I was grateful for the recognition last evening from the Hollywood Business and Professional Women's Club, which is part of the U.S. Federation of Business and Professional Women, which annually recognizes a man of Hollywood for significant contribution to community. So I'm grateful for that honor for this year as the man of Hollywood. So um, that, thank you for that. Um, Reiko, your comments, you know, about the all-female board at DWP and the intentional um, efforts to increase gender diversity, I'm curious about that further because I know DWP and many city agencies are facing a, a huge um, retirement um, 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 hit this co- over the next couple of years with folks just hitting retirement age. So, you know, how are we looking to fill that experience gap and also, you know, find the people overall, but also female leaders to fill up, fill all these retirements that are hitting DWP over the coming years? 
So no question, uh, Dwayne, that we are seeing that silver tsunami of retirements. But I also see that um, although it's a big challenge, it also comes with opportunities. And I think, you know, we know we have a lot of institutional knowledge walking out that door, but we also see a change in our systems with a lot of new technology and new innovations that are coming. And, and that, that 30 year legacy knowledge won't be helpful with that new technology. And, and that new technology will, will require a whole different skill set than what some of those retirees have had. So it's going to be, you know, we have to do a lot of work, and we are, in what that future workforce looks like as we have new folks coming into the field that have grown up with technology. All they know, know is technology and change. They've grown up with the iPhones, the computers, the games, uh, and those are constantly changing. So I see that as an opportunity to recruit new talent. Um, some of the training, obviously, is going to be on the job because that technology is cha changing so quickly. And we, right now, we have a number of training programs that will likely need to be expanded into other areas and de to develop new skill sets than what we already have in order to operate our system. So, you know, we still need to be intentional about how we go about recruiting, how we get those the other women in those non-traditional roles, how we attract those areas that are underrepresented. We have our equity data metrics initiative that's tracking diversity in both hiring and promotions. Um, if you're not measuring it, you can't be held accountable. So, so we, it's important that we continue to uh, monitor and understand where we're heading and not stop until we represent the communities that we serve. No, that's great. And, you know, and Phyllis, you know, I'm curious to know about the impact of the pandemic because we have not spoken about that. And, and certainly, you know, um, we are now coming out of this period and masks are coming off and people are starting to get back on the road. And there was a recent article in CIO magazine that mentioned um, that women in tech particularly are burning out and leaving the workforce as a result of increased childcare and domestic responsibilities that rose during the pandemic. And are you seeing any of these realities in the energy utility sector? I know, you know, they quoted well, one female CEO as saying that these facts are, are setting women back by a decade or more. Um, what do you think that can be done to reverse these trends? Well, I think uh, MISO is a good example of thinking about how to help the workforce ease back into uh, a pre-pandemic type of uh, environment, but also recognize that uh, they may need more uh, support with either child care or care for aging parents. Because, you know, parent care is sometimes as much of an issue for women as child care. Sure. Also, uh, uh, employees may need a little bit more time. They may not be ready to make that quick switch from being at home to working uh, five or six days a week. So some kind of interim uh, uh, plan to let people come in maybe a few days as they get back into it. And then also rethinking, how do you even do your work? I mean, sometimes uh, what we used to do is not what we have to do going forward. So I think having um, sensitive professionals in uh, the human resources and diversity space that understand that you've got to talk to your, your staff and get an idea of what are the issues that they're dealing with and then take a look at your policies and find a way to accommodate them. And I think this is something that MISO is doing uh, very aggressively as they uh, have all hands meetings with the staff and they try to get a, a feel through surveys. Where are people and their thinking? You know, how are they feeling? Are they dealing with their child care issues? Are they able to transition back? And what support would they need in order to, to deal with that? But I think it's something that all businesses, energy businesses and non-energy businesses are going to have to adjust to. Sure. And I know, you know, Rako, you know, talked about the challenge of the flexibility or lack of flexibility in the civil service system. So I'm curious to know how the Department of Water and Power is looking at the nature of work in this post-pandemic environment? So we're still figuring it out because there are, you can't do a one size fits all. If I'm a meter reader, I can't do that remotely in telecommute. If I'm right. restoring service, th those folks, we have a field folks that have been on the, on, the, on the job virtually every day during the pandemic because certain services just don't uh, lend, lend themselves very well to that. Um, there are other jobs that can very easily be done remotely 
or uh, part time, you know, remotely part in the office. Uh, so uh, I think what will be interesting to see is um, what the impact of not having. We, we talked about how important networking is and having that um, the culture and support of those around you. And, and when you're not in the office, I, I think I definitely see um, some of the impacts of that. So, um, some can be done very successfully, very easily. So we're really going to have to figure out what that new norm looks like as people start to come back with the city opening up now. And I know, for instance, where I uh, live downtown, uh, there was notes up in the first day California open that everything's open, elevator full capacity, no mass required. <laughs> um, but Aye. folks aren't comfortable with that. You hear those hallway conversations of, oh, I went out to the to the gym and oh my gosh, there's all these people and I'm not ready for that yet. And so, you Aye. know, it's going to take a lot of um, care and understanding and um, I think yeah, you can't just jump right into the deep end from day one. <laughs> Sure. So as issues of diversity, equity and inclusion have been elevated this past year and, you know, as Phyllis said, you know, hopefully it's not going to be something that's short lived, but will will live on. You know, what do you both see for the future of more women in the energy sector and more women of, and more people of color in the energy sector? Phyllis, any, any thoughts on that? Well, I'm seeing that every day, you know, um, both with my involvement with, um, you know, my soul, but also uh, I've still I'm still active in some of my trade associations. I'm heading off uh, Sunday to Orlando. The American Public Power Association is going to have its okay. first in-person in conference, uh, you know, uh, since the pandemic. And there are going to be a lot of women there. And there are women who uh, are moving up in their career. And I'm really proud that uh, every year that I've been a part of that organization, I've seen more and more women. We used to have uh, just a very small um, uh, happy hour or brunch. And, and we had a little nickname for ourselves, the ABs. And uh, we were the amazing, and I won't say the B word, of public power. But <laughs> okay. that group has grown more and more and more. And women who were just starting out are now leaders in their uh, agencies. So, I mean, I'm very encouraged, notwithstanding what the uh, international report said. Uh, I see women on the move uh, in, in the power industry and uh, in the IOUs, uh, the investor-owned utilities. You see them also leading uh, these organizations. So we just have to, uh, we have to be more optimistic about it. And we have to keep encouraging young women to prepare to move forward because you don't get to Rako's job overnight, okay? Sure. She's paid a lot of dues to get to where she is. And that's what I think we have to reinforce for people coming up the line, that you'll spend a lot of time learning different things, and then you take advantage of all that stuff you've learned in the management level position that you, you attain. Rako, uh, give me your thoughts on the future of women in the energy sector. I am like Phyllis. I am more optimistic than ever. I think we wear that AB badge with, with honor. <laughs> um, and it's very encouraging as we see more and more uh, women at the top. You are seeing more and more women at the upper levels of executive management. And I think that will be something. This time it's sustainable. I don't think you'll see it go away. And it's important that we hold each other accountable. And I think, you know, there's efforts like at the California having the women on boards legislation. Uh, those metrics are tracked for all the, you know, um, public companies. So um, DWP, like I said, support from the highest level, from our board, from the city, the city council, from the mayor's office, from the general managers, this isn't going away. And it's important that we make this industry the type of industry that we would love our girls to work in, whether it be our sisters, our aunts, our nieces, our moms. Um, but we also have to have a base of reality, too. Um, probably 60% of our, our workforce is in the field. And you're not going to get 50% representation of women finding polls and, and doing all the, the tough work. There will be, we certainly have a number of them in the field with our construction maintenance folks um, and operations. But 50% um, is going to be uh, difficult. And there's no reason why you can't in the office, but it, it will be a bigger challenge in the field. I think it's something we need to strive for. Uh, but we, uh, it's it's like 
I look at that like the female firefighters. You know, you have to be realistic in what your expectations are. Sure. The other thing is, as women, we need to make sure that we support each other. We need to celebrate every one of those milestones and provide that support. And we see these frequently when you apply for a job. You know, you all think you're the best candidate. That's why you apply for it. But when the woman gets it, the other woman that didn't get it should be right there supporting her and saying, way to go, because every one of you that makes it up there is another pathway for another woman to follow. Sure. Well, Reiko and Phyllis, you know, this has been a great conversation. We're really excited to learn about the work that you do and applaud you and the teams you've assembled to carry out this important work. So you've left us with a lot to think about and act on. But thank you for joining Civitas LA today. And as we like to say on Civitas LA, the guest gets the last word. So share with us a, a final thought or a piece of advice that you would give women interested in working in this sector. Phyllis. Well, what I'll say is I think First of all, they should learn as much as they can about the area that they're working in and whether it be finance generation, but also think about the drivers of change in the industry and and read the trade regs. A lot of information is in these publications and join industry groups and, you know, do the best you can, uh, but also uh, learn to be a good team member and that will set you in good stead to make the contacts and find those mentors that will help you advance. Excellent, thank you. Reiko, a final thought or final piece of advice for women interested in getting involved in this sector? So I would say keep your windshield in view, understand what your career paths are and what opportunities are out there. Women tend to undervalue themselves and we suffer from imposter syndrome and, and typically there's no basis for that. Um, a dear mentor, Marcy Edwards, once gave me some advice on don't lead with your weaknesses. You know, when we go for a job, we tend to say, oh, but I don't have that piece of experience. I have all this, but we're going to focus on that one little piece that we, we don't have exact experience in. The other thing is choose kindness. And, and remember that we do need our men mentors. Um, you may not realize it today, but you will see mentors and champions as you look back that have helped you to get where you are. So I would leave that with who are you helping to succeed? We all can make a difference. No, that's wonderful. And thank you, Dwayne. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes, Dwayne, this has been a good opportunity to talk about something dear to our heart. Again, thank you both for being with us today. I greatly appreciate it. And we especially appreciate it because there was a recent podcast article that we saw that referenced there are about 2.5 million podcasts out there today and about 220,000 of them actually last make it a year or 50 episodes. So I'm proud to say that with the release of this episode, we will hit the one year mark. So thank you to the Civitas LA team, especially Timothy Halligan, our program manager, who's been with me from the very beginning in developing this podcast and doing all the research that we put into making every episode um, happen. To Mike Ross, who has been responsible for our Civitas LA website and all the promo images associated with our episodes, thank you, Mike. And to Harrison Paul, who has been with me in the booth um, as my audio engineer from episode zero, and we have navigated COVID so well. Thank you, Harrison. And to Angie Pham from Emerson College, our intern, who has clearly elevated our digital elements and our videos. And so it's been terrific. So thank you, team, for the work that you've all done to make this last a year. And I look forward to the second year of Civitas LA. More importantly, to our audience, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this program. We hope you will join us in two weeks as we look forward to another great civic conversation. And until we meet again, stay strong and don't forget to get involved. To learn more about Civitas LA and share feedback on this program, or if you have a recommendation about future programs, please visit our website at www.civitasla.com. And we invite you to connect with us on Facebook at Civitas LA, Instagram at Civitas underscore LA, and Twitter at Civitas underscore LA. Mm -hmm.